Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villarese Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarese provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarese Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Tonight, we talk about all the home teams as usual. We'll be able to focus on the New Orleans Saints. They prepare for the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday. 340 kickoff in the Dome. Again, division, uh, division round of the NFL playoffs. We'll also touch on the Tigers after their great season. Uh, and uh, if we get a chance, we'll talk Pelicans as well. Joining us tonight on the program, he can talk it all, Sean Mazan of Fox 8 Sports. Sean, how are you doing? I am doing great. It is a fun time of year. Yes, it is. Saints are still playing. It's January, and we are rolling at Fox yep. 8. Oh, y'all are, y'all are killing it. <laughs> Literally. I mean, look, first of all, I enjoy each and every one of those shows, and I love the fact, as, as, just as a sports fan, mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to tune in nightly and, and to be able to have a chance to be able to, you know, keep up what's going on with the home teams, whether it's going to be Saints, with all your breakdowns, or again, the roundtables. You know, uh, you know, and then, of course, those that are really into high school football, which you guys do on a Friday. So, you know, for anybody that's in this market that really enjoys sports, what you guys are doing over there has been a godsend. Yeah, and look, our numbers have really shown, have reflected the, the growth of the audience. So we appreciate all of you out there mm -hmm. for, uh, for watching those shows. Um, Monday night, we have the Black and Gold Review, Deuce McAllister, Juan Kincaid, mm -hmm. and myself. Tuesday night, we have Fox 8 Overtime, which is really just kind of a radio, similar to this, yeah, really. It's just yeah, kind of, yeah. we, just, we just, no real scripts, we just roll with it and just talk sports, all sports. My favorite one, which, by the which, way. which is fun for me because I get to talk a little bit more than just, uh, just Saints. Right. So, uh, Wednesday, we have our game plan show, which has uh, been a mainstay for a while mm -hmm. now. Um, we did have Thursday Night Football. Obviously, that Thursday Night Football is no longer mm -hmm. there. We did have Friday, Fox 8 Football Friday. Obviously, mm -hmm. high school football season is done. And then we have our Sunday morning Fox 8 Live tailgate, which we'll keep having as long as the Saints are playing. Yep. And then, of course, the final play every uh, Sunday night at right. 10.30. And two apps now, because I downloaded one the other day, and then I updated the, the, the Fox 8 We have app the update app. on the final play app, right. which all of our Saints work is mm -hmm. on there. Tiger Huddle app is our LSU app, which we've now taken over. Mm -hmm. uh, I contributed my first piece to that um, uh, about a week ago with Joe Burrow. So, and look, I, I, I love LSU as much as I love, sure. you know, love covering the Saints. Right. So, um, I'm glad to contribute to that in any way I can. A proud LSU graduate. Yes, I am. There you go. All right, let's kick it off. Let's talk, talk a little about the Saints again, taking on the uh, Eagles uh, this Sunday, 340 kickoff in the Dome. And you got to start the conversation with the biggest story in sports right now. Mm -hmm. It's been on fire here. As soon as I heard it yesterday, I'm texting you. You're texting <laughs> me. We're trying to figure out what's going on. The Peyton motivation, uh, his latest motivational stunt. I'm not even going to explain it to the audience. Take it from here. Well, first off, we've heard of bats for bring the wood. Mm -hmm. We heard of mouse traps for don't eat the cheese. We've heard Peyton kind of doing Bill Belichick impressions. We've heard all these things, but nothing pales in comparison to the story we got yesterday where Sean Peyton rolls in with four armed security guards, the Lombardi Trophy, and $225,000 in cold, hard cash. In front of the players, he goes, y'all want this? Of course, absolutely. Win three bleeping games whole place erupts game on it was the best motivation story i have i think i've ever heard right and it really resonated around the nfl i mean that is it's too bad there was no no video of it because that yes. would really cool well to there's see. security video I mean, of maybe it. there is and i'll probably keep it under under <laughs> yeah, wraps right, right now but 
Whew, that was, uh, it was like, okay. Because, you know, you, when you sit out a wild card weekend, it's easy to fall in love with the teams you watch playing. Absolutely. And it, it, they're fresh off their victory, mm-hmm. and, and they kind of got the momentum. The you've, you've, been, the you've been, you've been, you've been, you sitting and waiting. Mm-hmm. So by Monday, you feel a certain way. You know, I remember thinking, talking to Lee Zurich. He's like, man, I'm a little worried about this game. I said, well, let's just wait. Let's just ride it out. Tuesday, it's Tuesday. Wednesday, you start the work week, right? Mm-hmm. And I have to think that uh, the Saints had an extra, extra bonus practice in there at some point. But Wednesday is the traditional work week starts. You hear this, and it's like, boom. All right. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to feel a whole lot better about this game. Right. I'm sure everybody inside that locker room is as well. Yeah, and, and again, just, I mean, you know, the, it, it's just drop the mic moment, yeah, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, and then walk out the I door mean, afterwards. I mean, just and just leave the... the, the um, uh, the cash and, and, and the ring and the, uh, and, and, and the Lombardi trophy in there. The, the, the visual of the cash, mm-hmm. even veterans who are making big money, seeing that much money piled up, it got their Can you just go to a bank and get that? Can right. you just go to a bank and they, just get, hey, can you give me 225000 in said, cash? Well, it's not like the Saints don't have that money. Right, right? They, they, they just got, got the old car. Somewhere. They, they literally <laughs> backed up the Brinks truck, yeah. okay? Yeah. I know they do it quite – they're going to do that for Michael Thomas pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, they've done it for Anthony Davis. They hope to do it again for Anthony Davis. I doubt that, though. But uh, they literally backed up the Brinks truck. But, I mean, again, who thinks of that? And that's why, you know – you see the, the wave of coaching hires in the NFL, and you see the games. What I'll always give Sean Payton credit for is this. He does not rest on his name. Right. He does not rest on a, this is the way I've always done it. This is the way my style is always going to work this way. I'm the genius. He has evolved, and not just evolved, but evolved offensively. Mm-hmm. He's evolved in his personnel decisions. Yes. He's evolved in his motivational tactics to, you know, some of these players are young enough to be his kids. Yeah. You know, and, and he, when he got here, he was a fresh face, young up and comer. I think he was in his early 40s at the time. He was the youngest coach in the NFL at when 40, he got hired. I think he was 42 years old. I mean, now, now it doesn't seem all that young. Right. Now, when you see some of these guys getting yes. hired at 33, 34, but still, uh, but he's, he's developed kind of into this middle age, if you will, of, of coaches, and he's really he's aged well, if you right. really think about it, in terms of his coaching style and his adaptability, because you can become a dinosaur real fast in this yeah. business. You know, I think you make a great point because he has evolved. Uh, again, you mentioned, look, uh, self-scouting, what he's done in terms of his offense, the, 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 uh, the Taysom Hill uh, factor this year. I mean, just kind of changing things up. And, and then, of course, you talk about the motivation, but you also talk about, again, also trusting guys in the front office, like a guy like Jeff Ireland, who has delivered three great drafts, which really has turned this entire uh, franchise around. What he did, and from everything I've been able to gather, just from just talking, being around the building as much as I, I can be, they were looking for when they hired him, they wanted to kind of transform their grading system. They felt like the grades they were giving, uh, they were giving players just did not necessarily match when they got to them on the field when they, once they were drafted. They wanted someone to transform their grading and scouting system to where it gave them a clearer picture, more accurate picture of who that player can become. Jeff Ireland was able to do that. I don't know the. I don't know exactly how how he views things, how his, his grading system goes, but it's definitely different from the previous uh, person that was in that position. And obviously, you can't ignore the results. And not just 2017, 2016 draft as well. And you talk about 2015 now with three players in Andrews, Pete, P.J. Williams, and Tyler Davis right. that have stuck around. Yeah, no doubt. And and look at compare and contrast what's going on in Philadelphia right now. Mm-hmm. You know. Peyton rolls in the, the, the trophy with the cash, and everybody's going, going nuts about it. Philadelphia's doing bulletin board, normal stuff. They ran the score up on us. Uh, you know what? The, 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 let's talk about the, play, the Saints players' tweets, what they've said, their comments. I mean, that's old school stuff. Uh, you know, uh, Leslie said it on my program today. Peyton looked at it as moving forward. Philadelphia's looking back. I, that's a great way to put it. I mean, Peyton is not nowhere near looking at Week 11 in terms of saying that right. he's going to. He's looking at the Super Bowl while while their opponent is looking back to Week 11. That, yes. that's, that's, that's a great point. I didn't, I didn't, that's the first time I've heard it put that way. That's it's, it's genius, quite frankly. But um, you know, cry me a river. You know, yeah. it, it, you guys are millionaires. Come on. This isn't this isn't you know a 5A school beating up on a single A school right. in high school football. Okay, this is. Two uh, teams, a defending Super Bowl champ, complaining about getting the score run up on. Come on, man! You get paid to stop. And look, Doug Peterson was smart to kind of put that, yeah, put you know, kind of stop that a little bit because some of their players have. But look, it you know, it's not completely shocking because in NFL locker rooms, they're going to do anything to get yourself Mm -hmm. motivated. And this is why I truly expect this to be a 
pretty intense from a chippy standpoint type yeah. game. I think there's going to be some push and shove and extracurricular activities in this game. Right. We're going to get into the Saints on their side of the ball. And, and, and again, what's it going to take for them to win? But let's talk about the matchup first. Let's start with Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Biggest difference right now in this team, besides, again, getting healthy, and we'll get into that, is Nick Foles. You know, uh, when Carson Wentz came to the Dome in week 11, uh, 31.9 uh, quarterback rating, three interceptions, three sacks, they held Zach Ertz to two catches. He was his main target. Uh, he was flustered. He was uh, a guy that, uh, that, again, was just turned around. Uh, did, didn't look comfortable all day long. Foles, on the other hand, again, going back to last year, what he's done thus far has been a pretty comfortable quarterback. He's a guy that sees uh, the entire field, uh, makes quick decisions. Also a guy that has the ability to scramble a bit, but, uh, but uh, one thing he's utilizing is all of his receivers, where again, in a lot of cases, Wentz had tunnel vision. Break down Nick Foles for us. A lot of people are, are really worried about Nick Foles here. Uh, and, and, and I kind of stole something you said the other day on my radio show, Foles Magic. Yeah, well, Nicky Magic, Foles right. Magic, uh, Playoff Magic. He's a guy that the best thing I can say about him is he's very aware of his, I don't want to say limitations, but he knows what he can do and he knows what he can't do. And what he can do is deliver the ball from the pocket and he will stay in until the absolute last second to deliver a pass and take a big shot. And the other quality he has is just something you can't ignore is the fact that he is clutch. You know, it's one thing to go seven for 10, which is 70% in the NFL. But if three of your incompletions are in that two-minute drive to, win, to lose the game, mm -hmm. then what, what good is it? But if, you know, you go four for 10 and four of those, incom four of those completions were on the final drive to win the game, obviously it's, that, that's, that's different. It's that he, you performed in the pressure moment. That's what he does. He has a, an ability to kind of elevate to the moment when his team desperately needs him and he comes through time and time again. He spreads the ball out. They run a little more too tight in set, which I think can be an issue Talk for the Talk about Saints. that because you, you, that's one of the things you think of one of the keys yes, going because, forward. Yes, because, you know, it's one thing to say, so it's Zach Ertz and it's Dallas Goddard. Okay, it's one thing to say they did, they did a phenomenal job of taking mm -hmm. away Zach Ertz. We know that. But don't be shocked if Zach Ertz has a good game or Dallas Goddard has a good game because I, don't, I, I like the matchup of the Saints on the Eagles tight end when it's just one. But when it's two... I don't know if their second defender on the tight end is as good as the Eagles' second tight end. So I think that could be a matchup to really watch Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard because you can probably take away Zach Ertz, mm -hmm. but Dallas Goddard is good enough to beat you. And right. he's, he's the guy that's played well uh, towards the back end of his rookie year. And, of course, when they played in the first game, Jeffries had just come back from injury. Mm -hmm. Tate had just been traded to, um, uh, to Philadelphia. They really didn't utilize Goddard as much. As, no, they as, 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 and, and they, course, they ran everything out of 11 personnel. Right. And... and, and uh, one of his favorite talkers has been Aguilar early in the season before, before Wentz came back. And, and, of course, we know Matthews is there the, you know, a, a, as a guy that you know, has been a, a season pro and obviously he can make a difference. Talk about the matchup uh, of the pass catchers against the, the Saints' uh, back, uh, defensive backfield and linebackers. Legitimate, legitimate concern. Uh, I think the Saints' secondary, if you <clears throat> add it all up and average it out, they've been good. They have not been great. They've been good. But they've had their moments where they have been bad. And it's a lot of quality pass catchers. And if I'm lining everybody up and I see a slot like Golden Tate and I see a guy like P.J. Williams is going to have to be guarded, uh, you know, lined up across mm -hmm. from him, then I, I could see that being an issue. That's why I said last night on Game mm -hmm. Plan, Dallas Goddard and Golden Tate are the two guys that, that really concern me in this game because both of those two guys you didn't really have to worry about in the first game. Yes. So I think that's an issue. I think Eli Apple has been up and down. I think overall he's better than King Crawley. We, we've mm -hmm. established that, but still he's vulnerable to big plays. Um, Lattimore has had a good season. Has he been as good as his rookie year? Probably not, but he's had a good season. Marcus Williams has had a good season, not a great season. So I do think there is a idea or a concept or a chance that those pass catchers can win that battle, mm -hmm. which could be an issue for the Saints. Yeah. Well, one of the things they have this time around they didn't have the last time is a healthy offensive line. So the Eagles? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. And that obviously makes, the, makes a yes. difference. Uh, I mean, they held Mac down last week. But did Kelsey leave midway through the game against the Saints uh, when he got, was on a, on he a blitz yeah. with Dallas mm -hmm. Anzalone? But uh, certainly, yeah, and that makes a difference. Um, yeah. Can the Saints get pressure with their front four? Will they have to blitz? I think Dennis Allen's been masterful as yes. far as when he calls those blitzes. It seems to be at the right time. You don't really know if 
Is Dennis Allen a blitz happy coordinator? Well, not really in terms of sheer numbers, but in crunch time or in certain situations, he seems to always call dial it up at the right time. Now, one thing the Eagles do not have, and that was this was in the first meeting, this is all season, is they don't have a run game. Right. They don't have a run game. Yeah. So when you go Once into a, a game, out, when over. you go when you go into a game knowing this team is going mm-hmm. to have to be one dimensional, regardless of the attempts that they have. Uh, if they even try to force the ball with Darren Sproles to get 44 mm-hmm. yards like they did last week, something like that, uh, I think that's an advantage for the Saints defense. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Sproles is healthy, but he's aged. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Smallwood, I mean, he's, a, he can, he's got a burst, but they haven't been able to run the football effectively. Have not. Uh, and, I mean, it's, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad. I mean, right. for, for a professional football team, where they're at in terms of their run, running, running game production, it was an angle route that Sproles ran out the back of it. And I can just picture it running a thousand times with the Saints. Mm-hmm, and he just that burst and he just does not have it. I mean, a linebacker just swallowed him up. It just did not happen around the goal line against the right. Bears. So uh, I think the Saints linebackers versus the Eagles running backs, it's a clear cut advantage for yeah. the Saints. Let's talk a little bit about again the, the defensive line for Philadelphia. On paper, wow, are they talented? Fletcher Cox, Michael Bennett, Chris Long, uh Nagea, uh, Nagea um Jerrigan Graham. Uh, I mean on paper, but I mean, when you look at the first game, uh, you base it off that, you know, they, they didn't really put a, a tremendous amount of pressure on Drew Brees. Uh, what do you think about that defensive line? I think it's got some top end talent. I think it's got some names. I think Michael Bennett missed practice again today, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So, a second straight week, he, second straight day, he's out. Uh, I think they have uh, certainly the capability. I think they're probably a little overrated just in terms of what their names say just they the should name, be yeah, the name. versus what they actually do. That does, right. not, not, that does not mean they're talented. It just means they're tight. They're slightly overrated. But um, if the Saints' offensive line is wounded, which we've seen four of the five starters have been limited and their mm-hmm. top reserve has been limited all week, so that is certainly something to monitor. I believe most of those guys are going to play. Mm-hmm. just find it hard to believe that all those guys would miss. Um, but if... If the Saints' offensive line cannot hold up against a, a, an offense, the defensive line that is talented, though a bit overrated, uh, that could be an issue. But I, I expect that to kind of fall into place for mm-hmm. the Saints, where I think that offensive line would be more than enough to handle that defensive Saints line. Saints running backs against the, the linebackers of Philadelphia. <laughs> Forget about it. Forget about it. I think I, I, love, I love this matchup for the Saints. Um, and Kamara only had that one catch yes. in the game, but he had uh, two touchdowns or three touchdowns, right. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ingram had a great game. 103 yards yeah. on the ground. So I think, I think this is a great matchup for the Saints running backs. I, I do, as, as well as the Saints pass catchers against a secondary that I think they try to challenge the Saints last time around. Maybe they try to double t- Michael Thomas. Maybe they try to double Alvin Kamara. Who knows? But I, I, expect, them, I expect them to play a, a bit softer and a lot more zone this time you know, it's around. Interesting because they've been often injured back there and just kind of piecemealing all season long in the defensive backfield. When you, when you look at, at, and you know, a lot of Saints fans are concerned about the Saints defensive backfield. Man, I tell you, uh, again, <laughs> uh, they, they have been shredded at times with that Philadelphia uh, secondary. Uh, to me, that's the weak link on the defensive side of the ball. And they didn't have to worry about Ted Ginn last no, time around. That's right. But they did have to worry about Trey Kwan. He yes, went off. That's It'd did. be a great time for Trey Kwan to kind of Get come out back. of his rookie coma a little yeah. bit. And come back out and, and, and be the Trey Quan that was the first 11 weeks of the season. Because that's where the really, that was it. And yep. kind of started sliding yep. a little bit after that. And, and, and so we're going to talk about this now as we go to the Saints. Because, you know, the offense has sputtered a bit uh, since that Philadelphia game. And, you know, you and I have discussed it on the radio show before. And I think we, we've even talked about it here on this show. You know, when you really kind of look at it, and you kind of look at it now as we've looked at it week after week after week, yeah, you can talk about the young wide receivers and not catching the ball and not coming back for the ball with Breeze, not giving him a, you know, a, a, a place to really throw the ball, or, or, or again, not getting off the jam. Um, we can talk about so separation, all that. It starts with the offensive line. The injuries in the offensive line uh, have affected every level of this offense. You know, again, Breeze gets the time. He's got to go through his progressions. Those guys get a couple, maybe a half a second or so to be able to get separation. All of a sudden, you know, these guys are open. Whether they're not open, if you're under duress. You know, the key, really key for the Saints offense on Sunday is those five guys coming back and playing strong. The biggest question is Armstead at this point. You know, again, he tried to come, again, come back against Pittsburgh. Uh, he got hurt uh, at, at some point uh, in the game, and then, and then he had to, had to leave. And then there comes the, the line shuffle, which makes him a little bit weaker when you got to kick Pete outside, move Will Clapp inside. And Will Clapp's done an admirable job, but Pete is just a better guard than he is a tackle. Uh, talk about the, the offensive line, because, you know, I, I think Armstead is going to try to go. The question is, how long can he go? Yeah, and like I said many times, I mean, he gave himself two extra weeks before he came back and yes. still got re-injured. 
that's a concern for me. So he's limited in practice. We talked to him yesterday. He said he wouldn't put a percentage on how healthy he is. He's going to see if he can go. He's going to go. Your standard answer from Teron Armstead. Mm-hmm. We've, we've, done, we've done this before with sure. him. I mean, it's just, it's, he's just, it's just what it is with him. You have to deal with it. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the separation amongst wide receivers didn't pop up until the, the offensive line started to. Right. You know, I think Jermon Bushrod did not play well against the Dallas mm-hmm. Cowboys, and I think he struggled from that that point on. And but I mean, he was your top reserve for a reason. You didn't necessarily have him, didn't want him to be the guy for for eight or nine weeks. So, I think the health along the offensive line is huge because of what it impacts the rest throughout the rest of your offense, in particular the passing game, where you know. Having to take in back will certainly help because they didn't have to, because right. you got a guy that can, that can stretch the field. But mm-hmm. other than him, you don't really have a burn. I know Trey Quan Smith can be, but he's been a little inconsistent. And if a team wants to double Michael Thomas, then it's like, okay, wow, well, where do I go now? No one's open. Mm-hmm. So if you have a, an offensive line that can hold at the point of attack an extra half a second longer or even, even longer than that because they've been dominant at times in yes. pass blocking, then, you know, it's, it's, it's all fun and games for Drew Brees and he can pick you apart. But – if he doesn't have that extra time, those receivers don't have, an, have that extra time to get separation, that could be, a, that right. could be an issue. And, and, and Ginn has become much more versatile with the Saints than, than he was with Carolina because we've seen him be more than just a Robert Meacham, take the ball deep type, Devery Henderson, go deep and try to stress the defense. Because of the young receivers and the inconsistency in terms of catching the football, he's been a guy that you can do a drag route, you can bring him across the middle, and he's been able to catch the ball. He's been much more involved in the intermediate part of the game than I ever thought he would when he signed with the Saints. Third and 20 against Pittsburgh demonstrated that Mm -hmm. perfectly. They ran the all-go special. He runs the dig underneath Mm -hmm. on third and 20, gets 25. It's standard play in Saints offense. He gets it. Um, and that's a, that's he's not always a consi- doesn't have he doesn't always have consistent right. hands. Well, I, I used to get into it with your dad 50 yeah. 50 hands. He's not 50 50 he's, hands anymore. Well, uh, yeah, and but he'll run he'll run a quick out. He'll run a comeback, and you know he can still hit you on a jet sweep. I think he's a valuable guy, um, and hopefully he's ready to go. He's got to be I ready. think he's his presence does so much for this right. offense because you know th- those Eagles the uh, DBs were biting hard on double moves. He can run a double move. Yes. He can run a double move and get open downfield yeah. and make you pay. Yeah, no doubt. Starts with the offensive line. They give Breeze time. He's going to be able to go through his progressions. All of a sudden, those young receivers, again, maybe they have another game like they did early in the season when we had four of them uh, catch touchdown passes. They, uh, obviously, when you, when you talk about it a little bit, the Saints' backfield, they can run the ball on Philadelphia. They did it the first game. And, and, of course, using Kamara in the passing game, talk a little bit about the, on the, the matchup again of – Saints running backs against this Philly defense. Well, I, I'm very curious to see how many times the Saints run their pony package, which is with uh, Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram on the field at the same time with Taysom Hill. Yes. Uh, they've really fallen in love with that package towards the end of, middle to the end of the season. So I, I think that would be ideal uh, in this game, just to get them both on the field at the same time. What do you do? Sometimes you line up in the backfield at the same time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you split them out. When he splits out, I'm talking about Kamara, yes. it's almost always 27 following him. It's Malcolm Jenkins. So, and that's a mismatch. It's a mismatch, but what, what, depending on where he lines up, sometimes Malcolm did a pretty good job of funneling him towards the middle mm-hmm. of the field where he had, there was always a spy waiting for him. But you saw in that, that go route on fourth and one where fourth and five mm-hmm. and right. Malcolm gave him the one-finger salute after downfield. It's a total mismatch. Um, so how you utilize that is, is, is certainly key because I, I just – I don't see anything really special with the Eagles linebackers. I mean, they're decent, but I just think the Saints running backs are much more effective in that role. I've talked about all week, and this is not just for this game. This is, this is going to be throughout the playoffs. Because of the inconsistency of the young receivers, Ben Watson has to be able to step up in these playoffs. He's got to be able to catch the ball consistently. He's got to give Breeze an opportunity to be able to, again, have somebody they can utilize down the seam. Uh, your thoughts? I think it's a big ask. I really do. I don't know that he's... He's had trouble getting open. Yeah. I, I mean, all the tight ends have. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, downfield. He has his moments. But if you notice, a lot of times it's a phenomenal catch and a perfect throw where he's well covered. It's, it, he doesn't it, – It's not getting he's, separation. He's 38 years old. I mean, yeah. it's just – and look, he's retiring at the end of this year. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Had a great career. One of our favorites in the media locker room. Um, but I, I do think if you're counting on him to be a dynamic playmaker, I think that's probably – not a safe bet right. because I just I, I think he can kick he can beat you in spots mm-hmm. and you can design to plays to, to to I guess to 
kind of sneak up on a defense, but for him to be a primary playmaker, I don't know if that's going to be the recipe for success. How do they utilize Taysom Hill? <sighs> Probably pretty similar to what they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, line up in that H-back or slot. They'll, they'll do some zone reads. I'm very curious because I think the red zone is going to be so important in this game mm-hmm. because Philly's red zone defense is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. The Saints' red zone offense is phenomenal. So sevens or threes is going to probably determine the outcome of yeah. the winner. And I've always felt like Taysom is good in the red zone in certain certain situations. So I think I can see Taysom having a red zone, a bigger red zone package where perhaps he's not just zone reading and either running mm-hmm. or giving. Maybe there's a, a few easier passes off of those plays. Right. Uh, let's shift which of the defense, um, defensive line. First and seven has been phenomenal all season long. Talk about that matchup against the Philly def- against Philly's offense. Saints defensive yes. line, in particular the interior. David Onyemata yep. has really grown. Mm-hmm. Sheldon Rankins has been a beast. Nice little rotation there with some run stuffers and Tyler Davison and, and Taylor Stallworth, mm-hmm. who was an undrafted guy who, who hung around and found a, found a, found a role. Yeah, Cam Jordan, who is just uh, Cam Jordan, uh, always steady, always consistent, always productive. And you have Alex Okafor, who was a full participant today. That is huge. Yes. Now, we got a little X factor here because I think it's January, and I think Marcus Davenport has had his moments, Mm -hmm. but no one's confusing him with the rookie of the year. I think make the Saints – prove the Saints right about you in the playoffs. Make some big plays because I think Marcus Mm -hmm. Davenport could be an X factor. That's interesting. Uh, The the linebackers have have been phenomenal, and it really starts with Demario Davis. Demario Davis and Alex Anzalone, they've really settled into that as mm-hmm. kind of the, Demario plays pretty much 100% of the snaps and they'll rotate Klein and they'll rotate uh, Anzalone depending on certain matchups and certain packages. You'll see 100% with Demario Davis and about 50 50 with those guys. But like I said, I'm very curious how they play this two tight end set. Do you have three backers on the field mm-hmm. with three safeties yep. and just three down linemen? Do right. you go 4 2 5? Do you go. Big nickel. I mean, I'm very curious to see how the Saints play this, but I do like the Saints linebackers when when they're matched up with the Eagles running backs. I just think that's a clear cut advantage to the Saints. And of course, we we touched on it briefly, but when you look at the secondary again, um, to me, Lattimore's got to be the Lattimore of last year in these playoffs. He's got to be a shut down guy. You got to have the ability either for Marcus Williams the ability to roam or to shade him toward Eli Apple. Uh, you know, when you look at Jeffries, who's back healthy, again, Foles like to throw a, a, a high ball to him where he can go up and get it. We know Tate's been a Saints killer in the past. You mentioned the two tight ends, what they can do underneath. You know, again, they, they've got some really good pass catchers. And again, as I mentioned, Wes, Wentz was under duress and did not, you know, go through his progressions. Foles makes time with his feet but keeps his eyes downfield. It'll be an interesting matchup in terms of the secondary against their pass catch. Look, Foles is playing well, but let's not confuse the fact that he just plays, plays play perfect. He's right. got five interceptions over four True. games. And he, I mean, those two interceptions he threw against Chicago, mm-hmm. terrible. Right, bad. Terrible. Bad. Chicago didn't make them pay. Mm-hmm. The Saints make those, get, get those kind of mistakes and they make them pay, then I can see a double digit win right. for the Saints. But, you know, you mentioned Marshawn Lattimore. I think, I think his. You know, one-on-one prowess, I think, is certainly legitimate. But how about Marcus Williams? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's I think it's, it's time. It'd be nice for him to come up with a big right. play or two sure. uh, in these playoffs. No, I would agree. Special teams, which, again, the Saints have been phenomenal all mm-hmm. season long. And you and I have talked about on the radio show, uh, just an emphasis on special teams with Sean Payne. You meant talking about evolving. Again, bringing in players and keeping players on the roster that, again, were great special teams players. Having them just for that. Um, the opportunity to not bring in one coach, but to have three or four coaches that are now working with that special teams. Uh, and of course, when you talk about what Morstead has done, who's been steady for years and years and years, and of course Lutz is automatic for the most part. Talk, the same special teams have been really, really good. Talk about their special teams matchup against Phillies. Well, first off, Sean Payton's patience with Will Lutz mm-hmm. when it was not easy at first. You're true. That's true. But it was one of those things where he came out and said, greatest kicker worker I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He had to stay patient. He's been rewarded. To me, Will Lutz is an all-pro that did, that did not get in. He doesn't have the name yet. You know, mm-hmm. kickers, it's, it's yeah. kind of, there's it, the Divinitaries, the Justin Tuckers. Like, it takes it, a while. It takes a while. Um, so I think Will Lutz uh, is probably had the best season we've all talked about, mm-hmm. but no one else around the NFL has really talked about. Thomas Morse is as consistent as they get. Um, and it's interesting because the Eagles can get, be a little leaky in their return mm-hmm. coverage. Uh, you saw that in the, in the game last week against the, uh, the Bears. So can Taysom Hill or whoever returns kicks, rise mm-hmm. to the occasion with a big return, that could certainly be, uh, to me, a, a help to the Saints. And I think that's an area where 
without having studied completely Eagles special teams, I think that, that would probably be an upgrade for the Saints. You know, it's interesting as you kind of look way forward, and of course the Saints don't have a lot of draft choices coming up, but there are some areas where they, they need, they're going to need help. Tight end, you've got to get better there. Wide receiver. Wide receiver. You need another tackle. Tackle. Okay, you need another tackle. You can't, count on, you can't count on Armstead. It's and an depending offensive. on what they're going to do with, with, with Ingram, Ingram, they need, may need another running back. You could need another running back yeah, as well. Yeah, no doubt. But, but again, you know, some, and, and it's funny what we just talked about, right? All offensive side of the yeah, ball. That's it. I mean, it's that? amazing, it's right? A, it's not kind of the cycle of life right. in the NFL. Yeah. It's how it works out sometimes. Right. Uh, game plan. How do the Saints beat the Philadelphia Eagles? Oh, how do they beat the Philadelphia Eagles? Well, I... I, I, I'll go back to the formula for success that they had early in the season where they were just drumming opponents. I don't think they're going to kill the Eagles, but there was a uh, score early. Mm. There was a quick stop on defense, score again, crowd takes over, and we've seen the look in these players' mm. eyes, the opponents' eyes when, when, that, when that Superdome takes over. And then all of a sudden, that team's playing from behind, and it's just really just a race to the finish line at that point. Uh, so I do think that's part of it, scoring early. But I also think just from a pure matchup standpoint, I believe you're going to get a lot of zone from the Eagles. Someone has to take advantage, which means someone is going to probably have some space to, to work with. Mm -hmm. Someone has to take advantage. And I still, some kind of way, I think either Camaro or Ingram is going to have a big game in this game. And look, go back and watch the tape of, of Drew. Drew was flawless against the Eagles last time. He threw one incompletion off the mm -hmm. blitz, the nine blitz times he got blitzed. Mm -hmm. He completed his next eight straight. I mean, he was... He was one step ahead of them the whole way. So you still got nine, and I'll still take nine mm -hmm. over the uh, – is he number nine too, yes, Nick Foles? Uh, I'll, yes. still take the, yeah. I'll still take the uh, – Nine in black and gold. The, the, the black and gold and, and, and our version of Austin yeah. Westlake. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you can't, can't talk about the high school because <laughs> yeah. they went to the same high school. All right, I'm, I'm going to do something a little bit different here. How did the Philadelphia Eagles beat the Saints? And I know it's blasphemy, folks, but your thoughts. Oh, that's a good Or question. can they? Yeah, I mean, I think the candidate, there's always a chance the Saints right. to come out and be dumb and, and, right. and turn the ball over right. and well, just not be focused. Agreed. I mean, agreed. I think that's that's number one if they can force some stops mm -hmm. or they can force some uh, some takeaways. But I'm trying to think that I guess the, the, the truest way would be because I do think the Eagles have an, a slight advantage when you look at their pass catchers versus the Saints mm -hmm. secondary. Not a great one, but a slight one. And if and if the pass rush is not there for the Saints, perhaps Nick Foles can hang around long enough to make the plays. And that's the other thing. Slam the door when you can slam the door on the Eagles. Because yes. Nick, if you let Nick Foles hang around, hang around, he can do it. Right. Uh, a lot of people believe the MVP is already uh, in, in, uh, going to be in uh, Mahomes' um, trophy case. Uh, make a case for Drew Brees. Uh, I mean, this team would not be anything. Without, I mean, it, right. it just wouldn't. I, I mean, mean what we go, what, we could talk about, what, about accuracy, completion percentage, percentage. Accuracy, uh, what he's done against opponents right. with winning records, right. what he's done against playoff teams. Um, and it's so funny because this is his, his entire football life, right? It's right. no matter how good he is, there's always a, a, another person that fits the bill, that, that, that looks the part just right. a little bit more. I remember back in 2011, mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers, even though Breeze's stats blew him out the water. 09 was Peyton Manning, yes, right? Yes. Breeze's stats are phenomenal, won the Super Bowl. That's and what's unfair year, about this year. And this year, the, you know, the, the shiny new you yeah. know, flavor of the month, or I don't want to say flavor of the month because I think he's going to be around for a long time, Me too. Is, is Patrick Mahomes. But let's just see how these playoffs work out. No, I, I because would agree. it's Mahomes' first start in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. We'll yep. just see. Well, and, and talking about those stats, um, what is it, uh, Breeze, 6-1 uh, and one versus winning teams. Um, what is it, seven, seven game winning drives, 115.7 passer rating, 74.4 completion rating. Pretty stout for, for, for Drew Breeze. He's pretty good. And he turns yeah. 40 in a couple days. Right, he turns 40. <laughs> All right, here's the other question But before we go to break. A lot of talk about if Breeze wins the, the, the Super Bowl, the Saints win the Super Bowl, Breeze says sayonara, he exits stage, stage left. Uh, as a world champion and retires. I'm not buying into that narrative. Are you? Yes. You think he'll leave? You think he'll, he'll retire? Why? It's a vibe, man. It's just a vibe I get. The vibe I, you get from I, talking to I, him? I've been around You've been in around the locker room since now since, right. I mean, I've been doing sports full-time since 08. Right. So that's, that's a good 10 years. So there's just a different, when he's been asked about it, his answers were always different. His It's not a, I'm going to be playing for a long time. It's I'm going to stay in the moment. It's And what really put me over the top was when they showed when he broke the record. Mm -hmm. Okay, when he broke the passing record, Peyton Manning's. He said, I came back for one reason, for a Super Bowl. Coming back 
No one even knew you were thinking about retiring last right. year. So okay. clearly it's been on his mind. Okay. I came back for one reason. So I am of the opinion that if they win, yes. I think it's more, think, more, more probable than not that that will be his last game. So, and I don't. I just think you think it will just go on indefinitely I, I, after that? No, I just think the competitive juices say that with a young team like this mm-hmm. with, that is just going to get better and, and again, will be less reliant on him being having to carry this team, why not try to defend? I'm not saying he plays three more years. I'm saying maybe he comes back the following season to defend. Maybe. Um, but a nice even 40 years old, mm-hmm. second ring. and Gosh, you, you know, know he, when, when you do something at a high level, I know, Sean, it, 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 and when it, it, you're still it, it, really good at and it. And once it's gone, it's, it's gone. gone. But I could see Breeze in, in, in it. I could, be, I could see Breeze being just as good as Tony Romo in a, in a booth. I mean, I, oh, I can realize. I can, I mean, I, and he's got business. But regardless. I, but look, he could be, a, he could be I think his kids are getting a, a politician. Now. He could be whatever he wants when, yeah, when he walks I mean, away. I, that's just where I, I stand. And, I, and I've said that really since the mm-hmm. beginning. Because, right. and the other thing is, why would the Saints go out and get Teddy Bridgewater unless they had an inkling that maybe this could be close to the end and we got to just have it, just got to cover it. But I don't think it's a guarantee Teddy Bridgewater's back regardless of if Breeze is right. back or not next year. But still, the Saints thought enough of him to maybe get ahead of the curb to say, okay, just in case, right. this is it. We got somebody that we can, that's a proven veteran that can come and lead. Interesting, because my thoughts on the just in case was, saw what happened last year with Philadelphia, Wentz going yeah, down. And, and you, you know you got a team you a that's going to contend, you, you know. And, and, and you, need, you need a quality backup. You need somebody that, again, this team can, can, can believe in and rely on, and that was the Teddy Bridgewater deal. Look, let's face it. Breeze does stay. Bridgewater's gone. Okay? There's no it, doubt. It may be gone even if he doesn't stay right. because th- this is one of the first years you're going you're to have either full, let's just say probably Foles mm-hmm. will be a free agent. Yes. I still think the Eagles go with Wentz. You'll have Joe Flacco, mm-hmm. and you'll have Teddy Bridgewater. That's better than the first round of quarterbacks coming out. I can't remember last time the right. free agent class was better than, than, than the draft class right. coming out. So my point is, inflated salary cap, teams need a, you know, teams need a, a, a quarterback. Teddy is the youngest of those guys. Mm-hmm. He's only 26, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think the Saints have to pay to keep him. But and wouldn't you have to anyway? Yes, but... I mean, I'm talking about if Breeze was to retire, it, and he'd be the number yes. one guy. And that's why I said it's not even a guarantee that right. happens because yes. unless they franchise tag him, right. they're going to have to, there's going to be other teams bidding for his Absolutely. services. No doubt about it. Sean Vazan of Fox 8 Sports is our guest. We'll shift gears to the LSU Tigers when we come back. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Stick around for a message from our underwriters. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration has been family-owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy-efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi ductless AC units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the best of food networks, diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Tonight, one of the best we have, Sean Vazana, Fox 8 Sports, joins us on the program. All right, so let's shift to the Tigers. First of all, wow, huh? I mean, uh, six, they end up sixth in the AP pool. Um, they could start next year, realistically, in the top five. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I did this on the show earlier this week. Let, let's, let's look ahead a little bit. Let's say the first we got a returning quarterback who's only going to get better. Okay, Burrow is. is well, you know now. I, yeah, yeah, I think right. that people have overlooked right. how the getting to know process yes. and how long that takes. There's a good possibility some of these juniors are going to stay. We don't know about Devin White. It'd be nice, but you don't know. You, again, you finish strong with this 19 class. You know it as well as anybody. Again, you will get these kids on a, on a Friday night. You got the young players that played a lot this year because in some cases they were forced to play. Mm-hmm. They take the next step. Favorable schedule, Texas and Alabama, your two toughest teams. Maybe you throw Texas A&M in there, okay? Florida is going to be good as well. Okay, but but favorable schedule. Mm-hmm. Championships in New Orleans next year, where, again, 
Uh, we sat by side by side, right? Okay. Be kind to the two to of the last two of the three championships they got were were in the dome. Talk about what could be. I think 2019 can be a special season, and I think 2019 belongs to Joe Burrow. I think it's his team. I think what you saw the last four weeks of the season was an offensive coordinator, a quarterback, a team that you saw they finally kind of figured out what he does well, and I think. He is good enough to lead you to an 11-win season, maybe even a 12-win season. Who knows? I think he's good enough, especially with the talent around him. I'll throw one name out there. K. LeVon Chase on returning. He was injured so early in the season. I think people forgot about him. And they didn't have anybody replace him, right? They have not had anybody replace him. Divinity is back, but he is more that opposite pass Mm -hmm. rusher. Uh, and Divinity coming back was a surprise because I had heard everything Monday. I, so I talked I. to a guy that's, that's pretty close to him that said he was out the door. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if he met with Ogeron or there was a big meeting. I think it was Tuesday. Well, he Tuesday. did get injured in that game. Yeah, well, I, don't know, I know there was a big meeting with Ogeron mm-hmm. some point this week, and all of a sudden he's, he's staying. Huge, huge uh, get uh, for, for LSU. Um, so, yeah, and then you had a recruiting class, which I think you're going to have not just – some studs, but some studs that can contribute right away. And Derek uh, Stingley, who is a full-grown man right now, mm-hmm. and a, uh, a, a John Emery, who was yeah. one of my favorite players over right. the last four years out of Destrehan High School. So, I, and maybe even the, the kicker, Cade York, could yeah. be a contributor That's as well. Right. So I think you got an impactful recruiting class, a favorable schedule, as they say, an Alabama schedule. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, oh, it is. It's, uh, it's not, a Bama and schedule. It, and I, I love the fact they play Texas in week two. Mm-hmm. Okay, get, get, get the Georgia Southern game out the That's way. Right. Get right. the rhythm a little bit. Yes. Week two, right. you play a tough game. Yeah. I like and, that. And they're going to be pretty good. Okay. Texas is going to be Texas pretty good. The they got step. a good little quarterback. I like yeah. him, Ellinger. So um, I, I, I think the future is bright. I think this was such a pivotal season because it could have went south, yes. and it didn't. And, it didn't. and I'm, I'm still not convinced – the team they finished with was a nine-win team, mm-hmm. but they maybe played a little bit better than the actual talent, right, right. and they got to 10-3. I think Ogeron, the Ogeron factor, I think has is, is been downplayed by some of the fan base, but I think it's real. Give them credit. So I think it's, they're in such a good place from where they were. When we spoke at this point mm-hmm. last year, how the, the mood was just the, so the anxious. The narrative w- was completely It different. was just a sinking That's ship. Right. Of course. And Started it, with the Notre Dame I, game, right? And when I went to the spring game, it was my first spring game I covered in years. I mm-hmm. went for one reason. I wanted to see the quarterbacks. Yes. I mean, they didn't even let us talk to the players after. They, there was, there was such a funk after that game. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my goodness, that's the spring game. Right. I mean, it's 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 sure. it's 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 the black and gold scrimmage minus two. I mean, it's it's not but anything. There was no positives from that yeah. point forward. Again, from the loss to Notre Dame to, to again the the, uh, the defections of the recruiting class at the last minute, especially Patrick Sutain, who obviously played with with Alabama, but other players that ended up going elsewhere that LSU thought they had. And then, of course, all the off-the-field issues that they had from the suspensions to the arrest, everything else, uh, all that turmoil was going on. What? Remember, there was a players-only meeting early, I mean, before <laughs> yeah. the season started, right? Before right? the season started. Before the season because started. Because the transfers with the quarterbacks, right. there was just a little bit of, yeah. let's set the record straight. But and I think that speaks to, they, there was, and I remember Ogeron saying this, there's, there was some incredible leadership on this team that I mm-hmm. think that's the one thing that might, get overlooked next year that if it goes astray right. that that could happen is Devin White is, is the heart and soul right. yes and Foster Moreau is mm-hmm. is I mean he doesn't he, he's 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 the he's the leader of the team yeah. I, one of the leaders of the team vocal guy very much more productive than he gets credit for I I, I believe much more vital to that mm-hmm. offense that I believe so you're losing probably losing White you're definitely losing Moreau mm-hmm. so I think you lose those two some so someone mm-hmm. has to rise but I think that mm-hmm. player can be Joe Burrow right. well I'll tell you what love to see uh, Morrow in, in a Saints uniform you know, uh, again, a guy. He's a throwback, that, man. I, I like no, his way. He's, yeah, oh, he's an inline tight end, yes. not afraid to block. Right, um, right. And he's, he, look, he's proven he can ca- catch the ball he in previous seasons. Ball. This year he proved he could block. He can block. I mean, and, they were, and look, they've asked him for that max protect mm-hmm. to block some pretty wicked defensive ends. You better ends. believe it. It ain't like he's blocking, you know, <laughs> right. uh, some nick, a nickel Somebody corner on Sanford. a blitz. Right. <laughs> so, but he can run the curls, the flats. He can run a little square in. He's not going to he's not gonna blow anybody away in the combine process because I, I just don't think mm-hmm. he's. That's just not him. But uh, I, I think he'll, he'll, his intangibles and his ability will get him on the team. Give me the fallout from the Clemson domination of Alabama, 44-16 to 16 in the championship game. Uh, how it helps LSU in recruiting. Does it change the landscape of college football? Some obviously Clemson's right there with them right now. When you mention Bama, you got to mention Clemson yeah. in the same breath now. Uh, you know, Dabo Sweeney's done a great job in building an SEC program in the ACC. 
Yeah, I mean, to me, if, if, if Clemson won the SEC East, it'd be Alabama and Clemson every year. Yes. That's an SEC. Yep. That's the best compliment I could they're, give them. They're, they're, their only competition there would be Georgia. Yeah, I mean, they, and to me, it would be them two every year, every right. year by Alabama. Yeah, maybe Florida every yeah, now, yeah, now, I mean, now and then. So I, I, think, I think Clemson is an SEC school that happens to play mm-hmm. in the ACC. And, you know, they play an ACC schedule, but still, they, they dominate when they get the opportunity. Um, as far as the dominoes, I don't know. I mean, I, I, recruits think differently. Um, so if you're going to Alabama for, for a national championship program, I don't think they're taking a dip. I still mm-hmm. think, let's, not, let's be honest, they were this close to, what, third national championship in four years? Yeah, sure. So, but I, I think it helps Clemson, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, little old Clemson, it's not really a, uh, you know, a football powerhouse. Right. I mean, they so, are now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, from where, they, where they've gotten from where they started mm-hmm. was a little more impressive oh, yeah, than where Alabama's absolutely. got, considering their tradition. Mm-hmm. So, but I will say um, – when looking at those two teams and looking at LSU, I don't think they're that far away in, in most spots, but I think the critical spot is at the line of scrimmage. Right. They're just not – I think both of the – I mean, look at the way Alabama's defensive line dominated LSU's offensive line, right. and they didn't do a thing no, against Clemson. True, true. A thing. Well, when you look at this recruiting class, will it be upgraded? See, because that's a difference. Right now I think they're a great program, but not an elite program. They were an elite program in 11. They were, they were an elite program when they were vying for the national championships. They're not there yet. Uh, can they get there next year with the guys that they've had and have one year under their belt or two years on their belt now in that in that SEC weight room? Now they've gotten some experience against top SEC t- uh, uh, teams, and then those young players that are coming in uh, as as recruits. Yeah, I, I think so, but it, it won't be it, some an unknown will have to step up that we don't know. I think they mm-hmm. can get there. I think this can be a special season, an eleven or a twelve win season. Sure. Uh, but I, I, for instance, I happen to believe. I look at Ellis's offensive line. A, they look a little out of shape. B, I see five guards. I don't see a tackle on that, mm-hmm. on that starting offensive line. So perhaps I think someone that's going to return to the offensive line next year is not going to return as a starter. I think there's mm-hmm. going to be a new starter on that offensive line. And hopefully if you can upgrade that, because that, that started to fall off before Ogeron got there. The, the, the LSU offensive line yes. recruiting was a little, mm-hmm. little suspect. It was. So um, I, I think – A lot of those big-time recruits went to Alabama. Well, they got four guys – for sure, mm-hmm. and they got Ray Parker, who if he's not a, if his grades work out, will probably end up mm-hmm. back in LSU's class. So that's five. You want to kind of probably get five, yeah. and that would mean fifteen or sixteen scholarship linemen. So I think you can rebuild some depth there. And I think there are a few players away. You got some of those players in, and how fast can some of those guys, those freshmen, sophomore, sophomores contribute? I think will be a huge as far as where they go. A few years ago, we saw some juniors stay to try to win a national championship. What do you think the possibility of Rashard Lawrence and a Devin White staying to try to win a national? Well, I think if anybody was going to do it, it would be Devin White. Um, I'm told he is legitimately. Now, hopefully this news doesn't break here by the time the show airs uh, on Friday. But I'm told he is legitimately torn. Like, he's going to be a top 10 pick, top Mm -hmm. 12 pick. But I think he knows how special this team is going to be. And he's just, it's one of those finish what you start. And, Mm -hmm. you know, look, look at Clemson. There was three or four first rounders on right. that defensive line. Yes. They came back, yes. and it worked out. Mm-hmm. It's a risk, but if you love your university that much, which Devin White does, yeah. then I think so. I think Rayshard Lawrence. This is a defensive line draft that, in a normal year, he, maybe he he flirts with the second round or, mm-hmm. for, or back into the first round. But but in this class, it's probably going to end up being a third or a fourth. If that's the case, you got to come back yeah, for one I, more I year. I would agree with you. And unless, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Monday is the deadline. The fourteenth, right? Fourteenth, fifteenth, something like that. 14th. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, yeah I think so. It'll it's be close. Monday. Yeah. So we'll know, we'll do on Monday. Uh, before we go to the phone lines, how big was that MVP performance by Joe Burrow? For, for Joe Burrow, for huge. his leadership, of course, for the, for the program, it was huge. And I went back and watched it. And you, I keep, we, we now have a definition of Joe Burrow as a mm-hmm. passer. We know what he is. He's a detailed passer. Um, he played his best. He got, I mean, he took a beating with that crack, that crack block and, and bounced right back up and really played his best game of the season. Everybody rallied. You rallied into the offseason. He's coming back. He's your quarterback. He's your leader. So it hasn't always been the case. Right. You know? So I, I think he's a player. I think he's, I think he's pretty much on the line with Matt Flynn. I think he's a... A good, good, good arm strength, uh, accurate passer, intermediate passer, drop in the bucket type passer, mm-hmm. and he's got great intangibles and he can run the ball, which I think you'll see a little bit more of that next year with a, a little more restocked quarterback room. Everybody knows that I wanted Jimbo Fisher mm-hmm. uh, to be the next coach of LSU. Ed Ogeron got it. 
Uh, I want Ed Ogeron to be successful, obviously. Again, not just being a Louisiana guy, you want obviously LSU to be successful. Give Ed Ogeron a tremendous amount of credit on, on what he accomplished this year. Uh, really, since he's been there in terms, in terms of holding the team together, uh, again, not letting things really slip. Your thoughts on Ed Ogeron? Because you, because you were one that you know. I again, said that they're not going to get Jimbo, which right. I mean, Jimbo was playing, yes. playing him. Uh, I, I thought Ogeron had done well enough to at least be mm-hmm. strong consideration. And you've been behind him. And I was not a Tom Herman guy just because I, I, I just felt like the whole time he wanted to go to Texas. Yes. I, I mean, he was, he was, he was never going to be here. Leverage. So to me, it was like, get the guy that wants it. And, mm-hmm. and, and I felt like he had done a good enough job. And they still have not lost back-to-back games in the two and a half. Two Amazing years. Still statistic. have not lost back-to-back games under Ed Ogeron. That is getting your team off the mat. That is not easy to do because sometimes losing can just filter in mm-hmm. and you're just in a funk and it's hard to battle back. And he does it every single time. And let me just say this. The way they, they played that game offensively, to me, that's, that's the offense they want because they didn't abandon the power run game. It was, oh, it was 70, 70% in shotgun with 11 mm-hmm. or 11, three wide receivers or four wide receiver sets, but they had about 25 to 30% in that power run game, which... Right. You can use that to your advantage. I think the perfect blend of spread, power, tempo, stall, you just got to finish the drives in the red zone. Let's head to the phone lines. Let's go to Tom in Metairie. Tom, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Tom. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Eric, man, first I want to say you've had a great show all season. I enjoy it every Thursday. Thank you very much. I want to make a comment on the Saints and LSU, if you don't mind. Sure. First off, you guys didn't really talk a lot about the pressure. I think if we get a lot of pressure on souls like we did last mm-hmm. game, I think that could really make a difference in, in, the, in the results. I mean, the Bears only got one sack, which kind of worries me. They have a pretty good push up front. Um, secondly, LSU, uh, Joe Burrow, the toughness. You can see him talking trash on the field after hits and pushes, and you got to love the guy. Uh, Debbie White, if he does come back, would it be great if he was number 18 and really lead that team? Uh, as far as the championship game, I think Clemson didn't play scared. I think LSU plays scared a lot. Mm-hmm. And I wish they'd be a lot more aggressive with Alabama. I think they walk up the field and look like they're about to lose before the game starts. Um, and then last, Coach O. You know, Dabo, when he got the job at Clemson, no one liked him he was for the a long too. time. Look at the team he built. Yes. Wouldn't it be great Coach O becomes a new Dabo in the future? Yeah. You know, maybe a couple of years in, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll hang up with you guys. Uh, from your mouth to God's ears on that one. Hey, look, there are some similarities between Dabo and, and Ogeron in terms of they're energetic guys, mm-hmm. uh, and you have to be if you're an interim. You, I think that's the way you, because you, you need that jolt of energy. Because mm-hmm. usually, if a coach got fired midseason, there's there's some staleness around there, and that's Ogeron did it at USC. He did it here. We forget Dabo Sweeney replaced Tommy Bowden, yeah, right? Right. The old Tulane coach. So l- let me just, because yeah, I, I got them all. P- people just gonna right. say that, oh well, you just compared Ogeron to Dabo Sweeney. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm saying from a personality right. standpoint. They got that energetic personality. So um, I, I, I. I, I agree with what he said because I felt like the buildup to the Alabama game just took on a life of its mm-hmm. own and it just looked completely winded against Alabama and Alabama was just business as usual. But what, ha- what, what, did, what I did see from Clemson was it, they shattered the myth mm-hmm. that you need a guy that's going to run around like Johnny Manziel and Deshaun Watson to beat Alabama. Right. Like Tr- Tr- Trevor Lawrence is a pure pocket yes, passer, an elite pocket passer mm-hmm. that may be the number one overall pick this year. Right. But you can win with an elite pocket passer if you have an offensive line. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, what about pressure on Foles? I think that's, that's, that's always the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't get pressure on Foles or any quarterback, especially with his wide receivers and the way he's been pretty accurate as far as pushing the ball downfield and, and finding whoever is open, then that could be a problem. I, if they don't get that, th- then I worry about the Saints' vulnerability on the back right. end. And, and, of course, uh, we, I think we discussed the toughness of, uh, of Joe Burrow. Joe, I mean, Joey right. Nails. Right. Joey and, Nails. And, and I think it's, it's without a doubt the 18 jersey will be Devin White's if he comes if back. If he comes back, and if it's not, it might go to Joe Burrow. Yep, there you it, go. It might go to it's, Joe Burrow. Sure I mean, to me, he's, he's – he's, and look, he's got, a, he's got a timely sense of trash talk. Right. You always, it's like it's yeah. always at the right time. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. And, and can, can I add something? I'm just the point guard here. The guests make the show, believe it. And it's always been that <laughs> I way. That's that. the way the show was set up. That's the way it is. Um, let's go back to the phone lines. Uh, Greg is in Homa. Greg, welcome to the show. How you doing, Greg? Uh, hey, guys, the uh, question is, is uh, who makes the biggest impact in the Saints and Philly game from two guys that didn't play, Darren Sproles or Ted Ginn? Who's, who makes the bigger impact on Sunday? I'm going to go with old Teddy Ginn. Me too. Because I just think he can stretch the field. you got to respect him. I think he's, uh, he, he's, he's going to get natural separation, so I think he's – 
you know, and Eagles secondary, they, they've been vulnerable as well. So I'm going to go with Ted Ginn Jr. because I just think Darren Spoles is just not the Darren Spoles that it, we know. I just think he's, this is it. I mean, I, they were talking about, we discussed this before we came on tonight, uh, that the uh, commentators were talking about him possibly coming back for another year. N no, Darren, uh, this is it. <laughs> You've had a great career. Well, he can try to come back. Yeah. I just, I, I, yeah. it, with everything that we saw, I mean, right. from the last game, no it's, just, it's just not there. Pelicans are 20 and 22 at the time of, uh, of our live broadcast. They're on a three game winning streak. They've beaten Cleveland twice, Memphis once. Well, <laughs> well you know. Uh, but they're playing much better basketball right now. What, they Back put 140 the last night? Yeah. yeah, 140 last night. They're playing defense. They're helping. All the things that we've talked about on, on the show, on the radio show, we talked about here, they're, they're finally doing the little thing. Now, they're healthy. Miritich and Peyton is back. You know, EP4 has really been a big part of, of again, the, uh, the opportunity for those guys to be able to get back up with their pace, his ability to, to, to uh, pass the basketball, and he's not turning the ball over as much as, again, we saw Holiday or, or, or anybody else that was playing point guard for, for them. Your thoughts on the Pelicans as we reach the halfway point of, of, of the One season? 1-0 in the second half. How about that? Undefeated yeah. <laughs> second half of the season. How about that? And every um, blind squirrel yeah. finds a nut, but go ahead. But, <laughs> you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen right. now, right? Right. I mean... Nico back, Peyton back. Wouldn't Nico have 21 last night? Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's going to happen, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. This is, this is the team they envision. And if it doesn't happen, then you're out of excuses. Right. So then, the, you know, the countdown begins. Right. So um, I, we'll see what happens. It's certainly not, not easy to get excited about the Pelicans mm -hmm. right now. But if they can get through the stretch right here, I know it's got a tough, tough stretch coming mm -hmm. up. But if they can get through it with, with a positive record, we'll just see what it does settle. Seven of the next ten on the road. Mm -hmm. It is a huge road, road uh, swing for them. If they come back and they're not winning in, uh, on that road, more than likely the season is over. And then you got to make decisions on what you're going to do going forward. Last topic, talk about the job Willie Fritz did at Tulane this year. I, I thought he did a marvelous job. You know, I, we, I called them out really, really, really hard after the first loss. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was another season of patting ourselves on the back for being close. Was not the case. Uh, saved the season. Uh, uh, what game was it? Was it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm losing up Toronto blank, but it was middle of the season where they rallied. It was, it was the, the win no one saw coming. Was it Florida International maybe, or was it? Uh, was it Memphis? I, Memphis? Memphis was a big one as well. Yeah. But I, I, regardless, I felt like he galvanized. Mm -hmm. The switch to Justin McMillan obviously worked, uh, and they 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 steamrolled through and, and 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 earned their keep. So I think the uh, they needed that season uptown. Right. Willie Fritz needed that season, and it was they, they cleared a hurdle that they had to clear. And, and I like what he's doing right now in terms of upgrading the offense and going with more of a spread, especially with the athletes we have here in Louisiana. True, uh, and I think that it's taken him a while to kind of adapt to that a little right. bit and to, to, to build some relationships up, relationships up here uh, with some of the coaches. And, and let's be honest, with the Tulane is – is, is who they are. It's not always easy to get into it, but still, I think that uh, he's, he's done well and he's recruited some athletes and uh, the results spoke for itself yeah. this year. Some people think he's just a Saints guy, huh? Yeah. He, he, he can talk it all. Uh, he can talk it all. <laughs> Sean was in a Fox 8 Sports. Thanks for Thank being you. with us. All right. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLAE TV at 10 p.m. You can catch us statewide Friday night, 9 o'clock on Pelican Sports Television. Catch me on the radio, Sports 1280, 101.1 FM HD 2 and the iHeartRadio app. That is uh, weekdays, uh, 11, uh, 12, noon to 2. Weekdays, noon to 2. Also, as always, we appreciate Sean Vazan coming down and joining us on the program. Uh, remember, as always, please continue to support our underwriters. Also want to thank our LWLE production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, uh, Naila Jones, Alex Chacon, and my director, William Hill. For Sean Vazan, I'm Eric Asher. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week for hopefully, and I believe it will be, you too, right, Shauna? Victorious Saints uh, team that'll be going into the NFC Championship. Thanks for watching.